Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. Today I have Linnea Lucan here. And Linnea, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I am a research fellow with the Arthur B. Robinson Center at the Heartland Institute. My focus is in energy and environmental topics over there. I went to school at the University of Wyoming and got my degree in petroleum engineering. And my minor, my focus was in geology. So I took that and I went straight to working offshore in deep water drilling. And that was really fun. I worked as a logging geologist there or a mud logger is another word for it. So I got my, I guess my feet wet in like in the field experience there. And then I recently came back to work for Heartland after having interned for them while I was in college. So now I am back on the policy side and enjoying my time here. Okay. So how far offshore were you? I can't picture what's what that is. Oh man, is. it's pretty far. The ones, so I was on deep water drill ships. So oftentimes that can be like 300 miles offshore. On at least one project, we were closer to Cancun than the Gulf shore of the United States. And they're drilling from a ship? They're drilling way down from the yeah. ship? Okay. Yep. okay. And these are the type of drills that can turn corners also? Oh yeah. It's okay. a lot of directional drilling out there. It's very cool technology. And what you're getting is oil or do you get natural gas out there or how does that work? Primarily, they're going to be going after oil. You get a lot of gas naturally in association with that, but what they're targeting is a lot of the crude oil that can be used for processing to make gasoline or plastics or whatever it is that you need. And then uh, were you into climate realism at all then, or did that come later, or how did you get to the point where you so, are? Yeah, I. Uh, so like I said, I interned for Heartland a little bit while I was in college. I had written a op-ed that got published to Anthony Watts's website, What's Up With That, when I was in college because I was increasingly frustrated with the kind of what I found was a very biased towards the climate alarm perspective, even in something as seemingly straightforward as a mineralogy course. I mean, they snuck it into everything that they could get it into. You know, I'm one of the few you know, handfuls of people who do their focus in geology from the petroleum engineering department. So we got to get slapped around a little bit for our associations with that school. Ever since I was pretty young, I had a little bit of a skeptical streak. I wasn't totally on board with full skepticism of the mainstream narratives on climate change until it just got so overbearing. I mean, it Really, when I was in high school, it was snuck in all over the place. And it really started to grind my gears <laughs> that it was all that we ever talked about, it seemed like. In middle school, I had a teacher who, or two teachers who got us involved in like environmental activism, basically. Not to the extremes of a Greta or something, but they would have us go and sell like reusable bags to promote recycling and that kind of thing, which isn't bad. I'm definitely not opposed to <laughs> that guy's policy, but it was all in service of the greater climate narrative or the idea that human beings are like a pox on the planet. Yeah. So I am curious about how much exposure you got to this warming narrative. Like, did they show you an inconvenient truth at any point in school? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they showed us an inconvenient truth and they showed us several times, probably two or three times between seventh grade and my senior year of high school, either an inconvenient truth or Gasland, which was a anti-fracking propaganda piece, basically, with very little true data or information in it whatsoever. It's honestly maybe one of, it, it's probably worse than inconvenient truth in terms of stuff that you can just look up and verify that it was untrue immediately. And once I got into high school, I guess became more of a person who was willing to push back publicly. And they made the mistake of giving us these iPads in school. So every student had this thing that they were supposed to use to take notes on and stuff. But I was using it to fact check Gasland while we were okay. sitting in class. And it wasn't hard to do, even for a little high school student. So it was everywhere. So it was presented to you as truth, and did the teachers ever show you any other side, or they at least allowed you to speak in a fact check against Well, it? no, I had, so my senior year at least, so my middle school teachers who were pushing stuff on us definitely were not fans of any kind of pushback. Yeah. They were not very nice to us. My senior year, I had a environmental science teacher who really 
did a great job of being supportive if you had harder questions. She was willing to acknowledge when, you know, she didn't know for sure what the answer was. I was that kid that was always raising her hand and stuff in that class. But we had just gotten done with a unit about greenhouse gases and stuff. We had another unit that was promoting hydrogen vehicles. And at one point, and now I know that this isn't the case, but at one point I raised my hand and I asked, you know, if water vapor is the most potent greenhouse gas, wouldn't driving a hydrogen vehicle where water vapor is the output be so much worse than carbon dioxide? Now I know that there's kind of a carrying capacity for water vapor in the atmosphere and it'd fall out anyway. But at the time, it was a point to be made. Like, maybe we're not yeah. thinking all of this all the way through. My teacher didn't have an answer for it, but she was like, that's an interesting point. Don't know. And we moved on kind of. But wow. it was, you know, you start to push back a little bit and... That was when you really get to know that teachers aren't infallible. Like they don't have an encyclopedic knowledge. So how about through college then in petroleum engineering and geology? Even then, did they sneak it in? Yeah. yeah. So not so much. So my petroleum focused classes were focused on, we do have like a mud lab where you're making drilling mud and learning about the different viscosities or learning about how different rock formations will react to different materials in the mud to get the kind of properties that you want it to have, heat resistance, flow, all that stuff. So we'd had these very technical courses for my petroleum engineering classes specifically. But then in my geology coursework, that was where you started to get a little bit more of a something of a bias when it came to your class works. I'll never forget one of my courses, which was a earth and chemical systems course, the professor was going through slides that had paleo data on carbon dioxide and temperature and all sorts of other stuff. And he flipped to the one that very clearly shows CO2 output lagging temperature by a couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. And he had that up on screen for about three seconds. Then he goes, but this one doesn't really matter. And he clicks on to the next that went up immediately. The next page was hockey stick that perked me right up. And I look around in the classroom and <laughs> I'm like, well, can we talk about that one? Cause that kind of looked like something that we should talk about since it kind of refutes this, or at least it calls into question the linear relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature, the way that it's normally promoted in the media. All the time it was stuff like that. I had a minerals class that had a social justice component as the last chapter that we had to go through. It's everywhere now. Interesting. So even in a geology class, they promoted the hockey stick as truth? And yeah. That, uh, it brought hockey stick up. That's dis was, yeah, disappointing. Yeah. There was another thing that I have no way to verify that this actually happened or you know prove it or anything, but I was sitting outside of an advisor's office one day and another professor walked into the advisor's office and started talking to them. I overheard a conversation where they said that the government or the funding teams are asking for geology coursework to include more global warming content for funding purposes. And that was the last straw for me. That's when I thought, you know what? If my coursework is being determined by what they can get federal funding for, that that ticked me off pretty well. That's when I wrote the article that I posted to, or that I had submitted to Anthony Watts, which just oh. kind of detailed my experiences up to that point and how disappointed I was that there was very little engagement with any kind of alternate theory for how the Earth's climate works or you know even just suggesting like hey maybe these models because you know we took a class where we learned how to make pretty simplistic models and if you push back and said you know hey i don't know how do we know that this value is correct for what we're inputting for carbon dioxide or whatever it happened to be and the professor would just brush you off i mean there was no engagement but that could be a personal thing it might not be reflective of the entire department. You wrote that article that got on What's Up With That, and then you ended up at Heartland shortly after. Yeah, that. I. Yeah. it was such a scary experience. So I wrote it under a pen name because I was afraid of backlash because I had some critical things to say about some of my coursework. I didn't name any specific teachers or anything, but I was worried about that. And they found me anyway. I had received an email from the, one of the administrators in the Petroleum Engineering Department 
saying someone wrote an article under a pen name. One of our alumni reached out to us and asked if we could try to figure out who this was that wrote wow. this. And so I got this email and my heart just dropped to the floor. I thought, oh my gosh, I write one article that's lukewarm skepticism and I am being censured by my what? school. At least that's what I thought was happening. But it turned out that that person was actually kind of on my side of the argument and had wanted to chat to get an idea of, mm -hmm. you know, how we can work on improving if there was any of these problems in the petroleum department and how we can work on improving that or, you know, what my experiences were. And so he became quite a good advisor for me into my senior year. And it ended up being really good. He's definitely a friend of Heartland and of a lot of the skeptic community. And he introduced me to Heartland for my internship. Oh. And so he said, you know, oh, you're from Illinois in the Arlington Heights kind of area. You know, this, this organization is really good on this issue. You might want to look into giving them some of your experience in petroleum engineering and, and the hard sciences as yeah. a writer or whatever else. And then when I interned with them there, I co-wrote a policy paper documenting kind of some of the myths about fracking. I'm very interested in finding out about your work at Heartland. You're on podcasts, right? Various podcasts and at the conferences, you're going to do something at this upcoming conference, right? Yes, moderating panels are speaking on energy topics. Right now, my main focus with my work is coming up with what we are tentatively calling our Energy at a Glance series, which is related to Climate at a Glance, which is Heartland's just amazing publication detailing different kind of commonly cited climate change topics. And we give the actual data and try to debunk some of the more extreme claims that have been made on those topics like hurricane frequency and intensity, that kind of thing. And so I'm taking that and doing a similar thing with energy topics, doing a short, you know, at a glance kind of analysis. So if you go on the heartland.org website okay. and type in energy at a glance, most of my articles on that should come up. And then making a video series based off of that as well called Exploring Energy. We also do Climate Change Roundtable every Friday at noon central. And that's a really fun time. We had Judith Curry on last week mm -hmm. and that was terrific. So we've been really fortunate with that show doing pretty well for us. Do you want to talk about the controversy there about the Judith Curry on your show last week? Sure. It's kind of the typical YouTube issue right now for conservatives and for, well, basically anyone who's just not far left, basically. We invited Judith Curry to come on and we advertised it and made the set the slot. So when you're going to live stream to YouTube, you set it up ahead of time so that people know when it starts. We set it up ahead of time and 90 minutes before the show went live, we received a strike on our YouTube channel from what I think is probably a manual review team. I don't think it was an algorithmic one because the video that they gave us a strike for was from like 20 months ago. It was like last year or two years ago. They dug back and found a video where we couldn't even really figure out what exactly it was that they were striking us on. They claimed that the strike was on election misinformation, but in the video itself, there really isn't anything that's all that out there. So we were, were a little bit confused and surprised. And then as we were about to go live, they stopped our ability to live stream on the YouTube channel for a week. So we had to move over to Rumble and Facebook exclusively. And that just killed our numbers too, because there were so many people that were getting ready to view on YouTube. And in the chaos that followed as we're trying to stream while also trying to kind of heard everyone to these alternate platforms, You, a lot of people end up dropping off. So that was kind of a shame because Judith Curry is really brilliant and she was so measured and so great in her presentation of her story. And honestly, I just think that she probably has some headhunters after her yeah. or something that are, you know, cutting down episodes. She mentioned to us that it's not the first time that this has happened when she went on a show. It's, yeah, I mean, uh, it's frustrating. Just, I mean, it just can't be a coincidence if it's 20 months old and they found it 90 minutes before Judith Curry's going on. I, I'm not yep. buying that. Yeah. No, not at all. Okay. You do live stream at noon every Friday. Is that right? 
Yeah. Her, so yeah. on the Heartlands YouTube channel, Heartlands Toot, you can find us every Friday at noon, as long as there's no weird circumstance like a holiday or something, yeah. or YouTube is blocking our ability to live stream. <laughs> we'll go noon central every Friday, climate change roundtable. It's really fun. It's mm -hmm. me and Sterling Burnett and Anthony Watts, and sometimes a guest. We've had experts from NOAA's Hurricane Center come on. We've had Judith Curry. We've had some others. It's a pretty fun show. So okay. I like to pitch it and plug it a whole Good. lot. Yeah, I haven't done much of that, but one big advantage is you've got the live chat, right? So people can yeah. uh, type in their questions and sometimes like Judith Curry might answer your question, right? Yeah. Tons of fun. We love our audience. It's so much fun to interact. And we always try to save a good segment at the end for Q&A with the audience, but sometimes we have too much material to go through to spend a ton of time doing yeah. that, but we love doing it. So do you want to talk at all about the Heartland Climate Conference? Are you still looking for people to sign up or are you full? As far as... I am aware, and as far as our registration goes, there's still plenty of spots left. February 23rd through the 25th, and that's at the Hilton Orlando Buena Vista in Orlando, Florida. And it's going to be super fun going down to DeSantis land to have our conference. The topic this year is, is the real crisis climate change itself or the climate policies that are in place to try to fight it. And we have a whole lot of good panels. We get so many great scientists who are just brilliant in their field at these things. You know, a lot of the times, the, the few times that we've been pretty heavily covered by the media, they tend to totally ignore all of our scientific panels and they just go to our like policy ones to yeah. get their moment of shouting at Mark Morano or <laughs> someone that they want to yeah. yell at. We have quite a few deeply technical scientific mm -hmm. panels that end up happening at this conference. And it's really cool to get to talk to people who are experts in their fields. Mm -hmm. And also all of the policy stuff is interesting as well. Yeah. So I've been to four other ones and I'm going to go to this one, but yeah, they've been fantastic. And all of the videos, pretty much of the old ones are still on your site, right? So if you want to go back yeah. and see what they were saying yep. in 2010, you can, you can do it. It's great. Great stuff. Oh, yeah. We, we live stream most of the panels. So You'll always okay. be able to go back and find it if you missed one or anything like that. This is one of my topics from Energy at a Glance. This is liquefied natural gas. Probably one of the, if not the cleanest burning fossil fuel products that you can run a energy grid off of. It is efficient. It is easier to transport than other materials based on its energy density. It is pretty darn stable. It's... One of the difficulties right now is the kind of administrative and regulatory hurdles that have been popping up. We in the United States are a net exporter of LNG, but that was not always the case. And I can show a quick some data on that. This is from the Energy Information Administration. They have updated numbers now, but this was back when I made this chart in March, I think of last year. And you can see the like really sudden change in trajectory on import versus export. So for a long time, we didn't have a whole lot of exports. We pretty much just kept everything that we took out of the ground and our imports were climbing as demand was soaring because it was so much cleaner than other energy sources and really reliable too. And then all of a sudden, after around 2008, 2009, a lot of the fracking revolution started up around there. And then policy changes came into place that allowed the U.S. to export. And we started building export terminals to send gas abroad. So not only are we having plenty of gas to run our own systems off of, we also had so much of an excess that we were able to export way more than ever before. Okay. So I didn't realize that that we see that orange kind of hockey stick that it starts yeah. to shoot up because of policy changes. It wasn't because of some technical breakthrough or something. The technical breakthroughs are reflected more in the decrease in necessary imports rather than the export side. The export side has to do with building natural gas terminals that were able to compress and ship gas overseas. And for a while there, we were building quite a few. It's still not as much as we would like to have. And it's certainly been decreasing recently. Who made these changes, though? Did it have something to do with Trump or did it happen before Trump? Or I'm just curious. It happened a 
I think a lot of the export terminals started up before Trump, with or without Trump. By 2017, the U.S. started exporting because of that terminal capacity that had gotten started before Trump. Okay. So he wasn't president yet when they started building these places. Is there a huge rush now to export more to Europe this winter? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. It, and that's one of the difficulties. So we have a major problem with our export capacity. So back in the early spring, when Russia first started invading Ukraine and they cut off Russian gas supply, or at least Europe said that they were not going to take gas from Russia anymore, our LNG exports were already at 85% capacity. So there really wasn't very much wiggle room. Luckily, a Cameron Parish terminal opened up later in the year and was able to increase our capacity pretty well. I think the data that I have in front of me says that it was an increased capacity of 1.1 billion cubic feet per day. That is a pretty good addition to our supplies, but it's still, I mean, unless you are able to increase the supply side, just increasing our capacity to export isn't going to help us very much. Biden administration has been extremely hostile towards pipeline infrastructure, and they've also been very hostile towards our ability to transport natural gas in ways other than just pipeline. So one of the things that is just bizarre to me that I, I know that they claim that this is for safety and environmental reasons, but it makes no sense at all. So the Biden administration passed a regulation that said that we're no longer allowed to move natural gas by train. So it all has to be done by truck now, and they don't want you to do it by pipeline. So I don't see how they think that that saves on emissions. I don't see how they think that that's safer. I can't imagine that there are nearly as many train accidents as there are truck, you know, highway related semi-trailer accidents. Very bizarre, unless you're assuming that they're just trying to stifle the supply side, which is certainly possible. But there are a lot of criticisms towards this administration for kind of talking out both sides of their mouths when it comes to the energy issue. If they weren't stifling the supply, then there's no technical reason why we couldn't produce way more natural gas. Is that correct? Right. So our ability to produce natural gas has to do with one, how any individual well or drilling company wants to operate their decline curve. In a reservoir, there might be a set amount of gas and it might be a lot. It might be enough for hundreds of years, maybe. I don't know. But you don't want to just suck all that out really fast or produce it really quickly because the pressure systems that you're trying to maintain at the well depth need to stay in a sort of balance where you don't want to accidentally collapse the formation and make it harder for the gas to come out. And you also don't want to go so slow that it's not economically productive for you. So there's kind of a bit of a balancing act there. So that's a like a non-government related constraint on the supply side. But in order to make up for a potential kind of slow production curve decline, you want to drill new wells. If the government is not allowing you to drill new wells or put pipeline infrastructure into place that will quickly and efficiently economically move gas from the well site to you know, a terminal that can process it so that it can be transferred to other places or to useful kind of outlets like your electricity grid, that's a major hurdle. And with the government now putting in place all sorts of new like methane restrictions, emissions restrictions on pipelines and also on, you know, drill site infrastructure, it just makes it more expensive. It makes it so that you have to go through more regulatory hurdles, do more paperwork. And all of this stuff is time. And in the oil field, time is really important, really vital. Every day, your company is being caught, you're losing money based on how long you have your equipment, because a lot of that equipment is on a well site by well set site kind of, I guess you could think of it as a lease. In the offshore drilling environment, you have a drill ship, and the drill ship is going to be owned by a drilling company. That'll be like Pacific Drilling or something like that. When you And then you have the operator company who comes in and kind of contracts out that drilling company 
So the operator is going to be BP Chevron, one of those. And then I worked for the service side. So that's even more. So it's kind of like when you think about building a skyscraper, you have a different company come in to do the HVAC. You have a different company come in to do the plumbing. You have different company to do all sorts of different parts of the project. And it's the exact same thing in the oil field. You have all these different companies that are charging hourly and daily rates. Mm -hmm. So every day that you're sitting there waiting for a contract or a permission to come through from the government to take the next step in your drilling process or your well completion, or if you run into something unexpected in the geology, every day or every hour that you're waiting for permission from the government is money lost. That has to be calculated out in the end and balanced out against the, the expected income from the well. So any level of extra regulation is going to make a well more costly and its profit margins less. It's going to impact your ability to, to make any kind of a money that you can then use to drill more wells to produce more gas or oil. So it's not that specifically a, you know, a little bit of an extra regulation that says you guys have to pass through us and, and fill out some extra paperwork if you produce too much methane that's leaking out somewhere or that you have, I don't know, maybe you're flaring and now there's new soot regulations. Mm -hmm. And if there's any soot in the atmosphere, then we're going to fine you based on that. Or you can have these kind of pre-approved limits. And if you go over those, then that's a whole different paperwork issue. Mm -hmm. All of that can shut down a drilling operation if it gets too much or they'll have to abandon a project that they're working on. And this is especially true for the smaller companies. Bigger companies, your Chevrons and Exxon, they can eat up some of these extra costs, but little mom and pop drilling companies that are out in Midland or mostly land-based drilling operations, they can't take on this many costs. And so those guys start dropping out. Okay. And so there is a restriction on the supply due to that. Oh, is there anything going on here where the exons of the world might want a little more regulation to oh, drive yeah. the smaller mom and pops out of the competition this is, away? This is something that I've talked about a whole lot. I don't have the link for it now, but I, I wrote an article that was in Human Events a couple of months ago based on the larger oil companies like Exxon and Shell, they are pretty well in bed with the regulators at this point. If you go to any of their corporate websites, the top bunch of things that you'll see are sustainability, ESG, all sorts of kind of green energy virtue signaling. And their lobbyists lobby actively for increased regulation on the oil field. And they'll talk about what a victory it is for environmental issues that we have all these new taxes on or all these new fines for methane emissions and stuff. And, oh, well, we just have to invent or put in place new technology, expensive technology that will further reduce our emissions at the well site and other places that these mom and pops can't afford. So yeah, it's definitely, it's yeah. driving out competition in a big way. And I think it's pretty obvious at this point that that's at least part of the reason why they seem to be so all in on the green stuff. It's either that or... Uh, they're hoping that they get eaten last, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that they can count on. Is there any dynamic where the natural gas companies might be uh, trying to demonize coal just so that they can get more? Oh, yeah, gas? that too. Yeah. I bet. I yeah. mean, I'm sure. Uh, there's no doubt. It, it's all being played back and forth. And, you know, and I don't want to talk bad on coal either because coal mm -hmm. is very inexpensive at this point in time. In the modern age, it's very clean. You're not talking about like early industrial Britain or something with the coal smog hanging yeah. over the entire city of London or something. At this point, the scrubber technology is so good that it's very, if any, it's very minimal particulate pollution, which is one of the bad ones that you want to watch out for, PM okay. 2.5. But at this point, it seems to be extremely minimal to the point where nitpicking at them even further is it's just that you don't like coal and that you're trying to shut it mm -hmm. down, period. But that's in the West, right? Yes. So meanwhile, you get China and India and some other places that are not utilizing mm -hmm. very good scrubber technology. 
and they are rapidly increasing the amount of coal coal fired electricity that they that they use and that is something that you know strangely enough our environmentalists don't seem to worry right. about all that much I do have a couple other follow up questions here. The LNG is kept at minus 260. I think I saw in a different podcast as yours. Is that right? How does the energy density compare a tanker truck of LNG versus a tanker truck of oil? I do not have the numbers right in front of me, but I think that what we have found or that I have found in my research at least is that the energy density of a liquefied natural gas is going to be higher than almost anything else that we have. From what I'm able to find, LNG has a is about 55 megajoules per kilogram versus natural gas not compressed, which is 47, gasoline, which is 45, diesel, which is 45, crude oil, which is 41. So yes, it is a it is a much higher energy density than anything else, and especially more than a lithium battery, which is only 0 0.5 megajoules per kilogram. So that's LNG is pretty clearly one of the winners on that. I think pure methane by itself is a much higher or at least a decent amount higher energy density than LNG, which can be a mixed gas. It's not necessarily just methane. Okay. And hydrogen is even higher, I believe. Great information there. I had Jerome Corsi on my podcast talking about abiotic hydrocarbons. I wanted to get your take whether any of the methane fuels we're finding here on Earth, did they come from life for sure, or maybe they came from something else other than life? I'm sure that your previous guest has done a lot more research on this than I have, but from what I have read, I think at this point, there is good evidence to suggest that some, and I'm talking a pretty small percentage, could very well be abiotic, meaning it's not coming from decaying organisms. We know for a fact that an abiotic methane source exists in the universe because you find methane on like Titan, I think. Obviously, unless we're thinking that it used to be covered in life of some kind, that Titan's resource of methane is going to be abiotic. Where does it come from? I do not know. <laughs> but I think that a lot of the confusion in the abiotic oil conversation comes from kind of the assumption that when a reservoir kind of refills, so to speak, with another fingerprint of oil or gas. So when you run a gas sample or an oil sample through like a chromatograph or something, and you can get the breakdown of exactly what types of hydrocarbons are in it. Mm -hmm. Every reservoir will have a slightly different composition. So you can, you can take a sample of crude oil and look at its composition and say, oh, this came from so-and-so reservoir. Mm -hmm. Sometimes after a reservoir has been depleted, they have gone back to it to do some well maintenance or to fix a capped well and found that there is new oil in it that has a different composition than what they had previously taken out of that reservoir. And to some people, as far as I've seen, to them, that indicates that there is an abiotic source that is producing oil at a faster rate than what the original kind of fossil decomposition. Although I don't, mm -hmm. I really don't like the term fossil fuel because I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes yes. in. People who are scientifically minded will say fossil. Well, there have never been enough, you know, dinosaurs on the planet to make this quantity of oil. And that's pretty clear. But when, when we're talking about oil that comes from a biological source that has been decomposed and compressed and turned into like coal and other fossil fuels, what we're usually talking about is like microscopic life that falls out or very tiny life that falls out to the bottom of the ocean and layers and layers over tens of thousands of years, if not hundreds of millions of years. And <laughs> The natural kind of geological movements will get it buried and eventually compressed and heated to the point where oil or gas is formed from it. That That's more what we're talking about when you say a fossil fuel. It's not like animals necessarily. It's a lot more algae yeah. and like phytoplankton and stuff. So the, what turns out to be happening a lot of the time, though, is that when you deplete a reservoir, you are changing the pressure 
of a geological formation slowly over time, but it does change. A depleted reservoir will have a lower pressure than a non-depleted reservoir. And if you are working in like sandstones and materials that are have good porosity, which means the, the spaces between the grains of the rock, that means that it can hold a lot of oil. But what you're looking for is good permeability as well, which means that there are pathways between those pores for the oil to move. So if you get into a lucky spot where you have depleted a reservoir so it's a low pressure system and there is a nearby previously undiscovered high pressure system that has the right permeability that just gets triggered once you reach a certain pressure system in the old reservoir, it can migrate. All that oil mm -hmm. will come over. And it's happened before in a pretty quick amount of time. I heard a story one time, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to share details on this because some of, some of this kind of stuff is proprietary and I'm not really sure if okay. I can say it. Okay. But there is a oil field in a foreign jurisdiction that American companies have access to that is very competitive and is doing very well. And there was a company that was working in a certain field there. And another company came and started working in a nearby field that they calculated was in a lower pressure zone okay. than their competitor's field. And so when they popped a hole, they started siphoning the oil out of this other guy's field. <laughs> And it started coming into theirs. So they kind of stole it out from underneath them mm. just by knowing the geology of the region. I think that kind of stuff happens all the time. And a lot of the um, resources that we don't know about yet are moving. And it's difficult, you know, if you're kind of used to a physical observation of how rocks work, it seems very solid. But on the geological scale, and especially when you're talking about very large formations, it's a lot more plastic than mm -hmm. maybe people normally conceptualize. So you get quite a bit of movement and flexion. And if there's any kind of good permeability in the rock, the oil will move right through it. And that's part of the theory behind fracking, right? So you kind of create an artificial permeability by cracking the rock and holding it open. And that's how you're able to get a higher amount of gas out of something like a shale, which is a very fine grained rock that has good porosity and not very good permeability. But you can artificially create very good permeability by cracking it and holding the cracks open with sand or another, like a plastic bead or something. Uh, and so that's kind of the theory behind that, that obviously is working out very well for us in yeah. terms of natural gas production. So this is the most recent data through September of 2022. And it's even with the Biden administration being so hostile, we still have pretty good production. The only kind of region that you see a little bit of a dip is in the like Utica region, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. There's a little bit of a dip. I'm not sure why that is. Might be that they have some a shorter production curves, meaning they withdraw gas more quickly and they don't have all that much to begin with. But like the Marcellus Shale and the Permian, it's still rocking along. They have quite a bit of gas there and there's really not much that you can do to stop it. it what's interesting is you can see little bumps and movement in these production charts that correspond to like the mm -hmm. pandemic and other stuff because when you had to lay everyone off, you can't run as many operations at the same time. And so rig count goes down, but it's it's seems to be recovering. But unfortunately, the price has continued to go up as well. So it's one of those bizarre situations where you have both an increase in supply and an increase in demand. Okay. That's so, and it's kind of killing us. This is a pretty big deal for the whole U.S. economy, isn't it? Isn't oh, it yeah. significant? Yeah. So the U.S. and also, as we've seen this past year, Europe, the impact of energy costs, especially in the oil industry, it, it has an effect, a domino effect down the entire economic chain, right? So if you have high gasoline costs or high heating costs for a business, for example, which has become a huge issue in the U.K., there's a lot of businesses that have been shuttered by ridiculously big heating bills and electricity bills over there. And the same thing can happen here. If you have 
high gas costs, high diesel costs. You have truckers who a lot of them are kind of independent contractors. So they have to do their own cost benefit analysis on whether or not they want to make a long haul with the product that they're carrying based on what they're going to get out of it versus what they have to pay in fuel costs to get it there, right? Mm -hmm. So, and pay for their rig and everything. That, if that stuff starts getting more expensive, if the transportation costs get more expensive, then the cost of the good has to go up as well. Not to mention the fact that, you know, to this day, most of our factories and everything, food processing plants and everything, they're not running on solar and wind. So it's all related to fossil fuel costs. The Northeast has a particular problem because they have amazing geologic capacity for natural gas and coal, but they are extremely hostile towards pipeline infrastructure. So actually Boston has been importing Russian natural gas for years because it's easier for them to get it from there than to deal with all the American regulations and they don't have the pipeline infrastructure for it. Plus there's a shipping act called the Jones Act that makes it so that you can't just like launch a ship from all of the LNG terminals in mm -hmm. the Gulf of Mexico and have it land in the Boston Harbor and offload their product there. It's not legal under the Jones Act. So that kind of thing can totally screw up their ability to get affordable, reasonable gas. Recently, we've seen a pretty large spike in imports from Canada, partly for that reason. But you can't get it from the Utica Formation, which is in your own state, but you can import from Canada or Russia or something. Kind of ridiculous, but that's the way it's yeah. set up right now. <laughs> and it, I'm not it, so sure that there's very much political desire to make a change on that front. So is Boston still getting natural gas from Russia right now, or it's coming from I, Canada? So last year, they still were. When I first did this analysis, shortly after the embargoes or the alleged embargoes started, a lot of this, and this is interesting in terms of the, the Russian conflict over there, a lot of the stated embargoes on Russian fuel are just that. They're we are going to do this to you if you don't stop right now. And then they just don't. <laughs> and so a lot of Europe is still getting Russian fuel. Oh, it's just less okay. than it was before. And I would, I do not know this for sure, but I would suspect that also probably the US is still getting Russian fuel. But that data does exist. It can be pulled from the Energy Information Administration, probably, just like the Canada data is. But what's interesting yeah. is you can see. If you look at, and I can share this screen okay. as well. So you can see from the Canadian data here for our, our natural gas trade by pipeline had a, a decently downward trend on the imports from Canada as we were getting that shale revolution. Mm -hmm. We were pretty flatlined here and it started going down as we started making our own natural gas in a big way. Started importing a little bit more at the beginning of the Trump administration towards the end of the Obama administration dips back down under Trump and spikes right back up under Biden. Yeah. Meanwhile, our exports to Canada have pretty well flatlined. And that's partially because we try to export to them because they don't have as good of a refining capacity as we do. Mm -hmm. We have those good export terminals and they don't have as many export terminals. So we used to have pretty good relationship going with them on that, but it's kind of all up in the air. And I know that even the Trudeau government who speak very publicly on their opposition to fossil fuels are not necessarily happy with the Biden administration for canceling that expanded oh. portion of Keystone because that was going to be quite a boon to Alberta. And they were looking forward to the increased production through there, but now we have to send it by train. It's still getting here. So they've saved zero on emissions in regards to the Keystone, Fine. but I guess whoever is the owner of the trains is happy. So. <laughs> Warren Buffett, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, Some I think of the trains. probably Warren Buffett. Okay. Do you know about any problems with refinery fires or anything? Is anything with You know, and I try to be fair to wind and solar on this too. Industrial accidents happen and they will happen. It doesn't matter how much OSHA stuff is going on. I would, so I, I try not to be too hard on, you know, because people will bring up that you know, you have big battery storage facilities and they can spontaneously combust. And it has happened. It's happened several times in South Korea where they've just almost completely given up on 
large scale battery storage facilities because of this. It happened here in the United States in Illinois. It happened in, I believe, New Mexico a couple of years ago as well. But refineries do have accidents as well. And power plants have accidents. If it's an industrial facility that's, facility that's dealing with large quantities of a combustible material, then there is a threat of that. But our ability to mitigate that is pretty great. And I don't really think that that's something that can count against using the fuel. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to uh, share or stress before we wrap up? In regards to natural gas use. So recently in the news, the Biden administration has been kind of cluing in that they're interested in trying to ban gas powered stoves. This isn't a huge surprise since many of their favored cities have already gone through with this. I think New York, many places in California have banned new homes from being constructed with gas stoves. It all has to be electric or I guess induction, which is electric. I don't know if our elected officials realize this or not. And this is something that Judith Curry has pointed out as well. But it's not so much just their obsession with reducing emissions. That's the problem here. But the speed at which they insist on doing it is actually... I think putting us into somewhat of a precarious position where we are relying more and more on the electrical grid. And it was going to happen anyway from population growth and to an extent, you know, the building new neighborhoods. Anytime you add new houses onto the grid, your your demand is going to go up. But this insistence that we go to all electric everything and that we do it like now, <laughs> that all of our stuff has to be run on, you know, they want you to have an electric car. They want you to have your stove and your home heating all electric. They want you to have more of a work from home or kind of computer-based career. Uh, they even banned the new sale of gas-powered mowers and stuff or gas grills. <laughs> you know, they, they just, they want to stop you from having anything that might put off any kind of emissions at all. But the problem is, is that they're also reducing our grid's ability to provide power right. by focusing in on these intermittent sources, these sources like wind and solar, and to a certain but lesser extent hydro, because they don't like hydro, but hydro is also kind of weather dependent. If you have a long period of drought, it doesn't work nearly as well, which California often has. <laughs> but California has been having problems with blackouts. Many places in Europe, like Germany especially, have been dealing with blackouts and this past winter, well, last two years ago, Texas had their big grid blackout. And this last summer, they were asking people in Texas and in California to not charge their electric cars during primary use hours. So it seems like more and more they're putting us in this position where blackouts are going to be the norm. And I would caution people to not get too used to it and to just like roll over and accept it. But I I'm curious to know if our legislators really have been given the full background knowledge that they would need to understand how this energy system works and how much pressure they're putting on it. And I wonder if if they already do know that and they don't care because they they care so much more about pleasing the kind of alarmist side of the climate issue, or if they really think that the world is going to end if we don't mm -hmm. stop emitting carbon dioxide, which I think is a position that even a lot of the premier climate scientists that that side of the argument quotes from, I think a lot of them would even hesitate to agree entirely with the catastrophe narrative, although they might not disagree with it publicly. But these kind of big overarching policy decisions aren't, they're clearly not being balanced accurately with the cost. And the cost when it comes to like home heating and stuff really is, I mean, it's pretty dangerous. So just wanted to bring that up because people will kind of laugh and they'll say, you know, well, they're banning a gas stove. It's not that big of a deal. It's annoying if you like to cook and if you prefer a gas stove, but you can use induction or whatever. Well, that's not really the point. All right, all right. <laughs> the point is... Our grid is already, in some cases, aging very badly and hasn't been updated in a long time, and it needs those updates. And also, it's increasingly dependent on unreliable source. And so it's yeah. just a general trend towards making blackouts every time the weather gets weird kind of a given at this point, and it's not good. <laughs>
So yeah, I just drove by a community solar garden in Duluth, Minnesota, right after a snowstorm. The snow banks are like five feet tall and they're all covered with snow. And the whole idea that everybody in Duluth is going to heat their house using those solar panels is completely farcical. It's it's dangerous yeah. because and people say, well, you just need to install the battery capacity to handle it, to store yeah. it up in case there's a big storm. Well, I don't know if people have really done the math on what not. that would no. look like because I and I mean they're all waiting for like a battery will break through, right? They're like, mm -hmm. well, we're going to invent better batteries, so it won't matter. By the time they're invented, we'll be good to go. Well, you can't plan infrastructure based on something that doesn't exist yet. Right. And it's you're playing with people's lives in a very literal sense when it comes to home heating in the winter, especially. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, maybe maybe it's a big conspiracy and all the generator companies are <laughs> getting excited that people aren't going to be able to <laughs> heat their homes without a gas generator. Okay. But man, it's getting yeah. it's getting a little bit scary. It, it is. OK. Any other points you'd like to make before we go ahead and wrap it up? I think I'm OK. Okay. This has been very good. I really appreciate your time and I'll uh, try to get this up on the internet as soon as I can, but thank you very much. Thank you. Talk to you next time. All right. Goodbye. Have Goodbye. a good day.